All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I am very delighted to be here. Um, it, it might, it might uh, betray how old I am because I do remember coming here or getting very excited when I was in primary three or primary four when it was announced that we are building a science center. So uh, I do remember coming here probably when I was maybe primary six or secondary one to this facility here. And you know, it was amazing for me because it really, uh, I, I, had, I had just been watching when I was 10 years old, again, I'm going to belie my age, uh, on the black and white TV at home, the landing on the moon by Neil Armstrong. So that completely changed my understanding or even my appreciation of what are we doing and why, where are we doing whatever we are doing, how does all, all of these things come together. And when the Science Center opened up, I remember the moon rock was brought here by, I don't remember which of those astronauts. And that really, you know, it's like, really? The moon is not made by cheese? It's actually, they have rocks there, it's not made, it's not made from cheese. So the Science Center holds very dear memories for me. So the Science Center, honestly, is the place where we have, let me just stand here and do this is the Singapore Science Centre celebrates the triumph of science and the sharing of knowledge. That's what we are here. We are here to share knowledge, all of us. Because I know something, you know something, together we may build something even better. You walk out of this facility, you go across the, the roadway, you go into the next building, there is a model of the DNA, the Crick model, which is amazing in itself. How do we know that even something like that existed? It was not until the 1950s when this thing was figured out that finally we have a language to describe what we are made up of. That to me was, it's just fascinating stuff. So the pursuit of curiosity, which is the essence of what makes us all human. We are all curious. There's a little girl somewhere there who is really curious about everything around. She goes and pulls this, and, and if you're not careful, she, your, your laptop is going to go with that. There you go. She's very excited right now. Yeah, I'm talking about you, young lady. <laughs> She's, the, I think, the, the youngest possible uh, participant at Force Asia. We need to have her on an alumni list right now. So next year, she come and explain to us what she did in the, <laughs> the next 12 months from today. So this is what defines us as humans, the idea that you have a significant amount of curiosity, and it is an unending pursuit of, of what is it that makes us who we are. The science around us is just fascinating, and when you tie that with the fact that <clears throat> when you have a lot more people empowered to make this happen, the acceleration of this curiosity and the discovery of stuff becomes enormous. We all are very well aware of it. How many of you watched the live telecast on, uh, on NASA TV of the gravitational wave announcement. It, come on, the rest of you. Well, I know, it was the wrong time zone. I understand that. But I was away. I just wanted to make sure that I wanted to see this for myself. Exactly what the heck did Einstein say 100 years ago that finally we are able to test? So testing is a very critical thing as far as science is concerned. So science wins because of peer review and because you can independently verify that what was done or created or suggested or documented can be repeated by somebody else, can be reproduced. That's what the entire phrase, the scientific way or the scientific method is all about. That you can reproduce, I can write it up, I can write a paper, Imagine Einstein did what he did where there were no computers. He did everything in his head and on a, on a chalkboard, no whiteboard then. And on paper, it's amazing that he was able to do what he did, wrote it down, he got upset by the fact that he couldn't get it 
uh, uh, confirmed, but a hundred years later, we finally were able to do it. The rest of us managed to catch up with the technology to make that happen. So, while the last 100 years from Einstein's point of view was a failure because nobody could prove that there's such a thing as gravitational waves, the fact is you the failure was what that triggered, let's examine this other ways. Failure is not negative. Failure is a suggestion that maybe the path you took was not quite right. That's how open source software works as well. We write something that solves a certain problem and then you find, you know, that's not exactly what I want. Doesn't matter. Failure is a fantastic teacher. I tell this to my sons. It's okay to fail. My wife doesn't like that phrase. She's a school teacher, so she comes with a different set of baggage. My baggage is, it's okay. Failure is fine. Fail, fail as much as you can. Learn from that process. Because you know what happens when you succeed? You don't learn much. Success is not a good teacher. But failure is a fantastic teacher. <clears throat> so the acknowledgement that assumptions need to be revised and paths to be uh, uh, re-explored. And just as openness and sharing science continues to benefit all of us, forces mimicking of this process probably suggests something. Does it suggest that force has won the game in software development? in how people consume technologies? Okay, before I answer the question, I would like to get a show of hands. How many of you today think in this audience that FOSS, free open source software, has won the technology race? How many of you? I I'm not putting my hand, I'm just giving you a suggestion. Left or right hand, I don't care. All right. A fair amount. That's a few. Okay, so the rest who did not put it up because you have no idea what I asked or you think we didn't succeed? There's no such thing as a winner. There's no such thing as a winner. Okay. I think you're on to something. So I don't think there is necessarily a winning strategy or a winner per se. Winning is not the end point. We want to go past that. So. I posit that the following. I'm going to go through a little bit of setting the stage. FOSS is now entering phase three. So what is phase three? In order to go to phase three, we have to go to phase zero. What is phase zero? Phase zero was, I would define as the time when Charles Babbage, if I use him as a marker, if you allow me to do that. We can go all the way back to the beginning of time as far as human endeavor is concerned in recording, observing things, and trying to figure out what is going on. All the way until 1985 as phase zero. This is where we were seeing all kinds of software being written, created, primarily as a tool to enable to work with hardware. Primarily for that purpose in general. It was to make the hardware work, in general. There were special cases where it went beyond that, but in general, that was what it was. Then in 1985, our good friend, anybody know who RMS is? Okay, and who doesn't know who RMS is? It's not root mean square. <laughs> if you came through one of the displays, there will be a root mean square somewhere. It is Richard Stallman, all right? Richard Stallman was the guy who crafted and set up the Free Software Foundation, and he wrote down four freedoms that were critical from his perspective. Quick review, how many of you know what the four freedoms of software are? We got one person, two, come on, others, three. All right, this is a quiz. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Got it? Freedom zero. There'll be a quiz at the end of this. Freedom one is the freedom to study how the program works. 
and change it so it does your com uh, computing as you wish. Access to the source code, therefore, is a precondition for this. Again, you walk out of this marquee, you go into the next building, you will see a, a mock-up of the DNA. You look at the helix, the, 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 the helix there, and that is amazing because that's what encodes who we are, who everything else is on the planet, as far as we know. In other planets, we don't know yet, even if there is. But the fact that you have the ability to look at it and understand and tweak it to your needs is critical. That is freedom one. Freedom two is the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor. We all, especially the kids in this audience, the kids in the audience love to share all your, or in a lot of cases, you're forced to share your toys with your siblings. There's only going to be one ball and you're going to share this with everybody. N not every child is going to get a ball for themselves. Now, sharing is what we grew up with. That was our ethos. Why is it that in software, you don't have this notion of sharing? Why is it software, suddenly, that's a no-go zone? Makes no sense. It confuses us. So Richard Stallman wrote this up to share and distribute. And the last freedom is the freedom to redistribute or distribute copies of your modified software for anybody. All of the three, freedom one, two, and three, requires and necessarily need to have access to the source code. If you don't have it, you can't enjoy any of these freedoms. You cannot enjoy, you cannot pass on that right to the next person. That's a fantastic, brilliant hack that Richard did and set a framework for us to share software ideas. So now we have a way to think about this. Am I doing this right? It granted the license to collaborate and encouraged the overt sharing of ideas. Not a covert, but an overt, explicit. I share this with you. Go ahead and do what you want. And that became a, a, the, the meme for all ends and purposes. Then we transitioned to phase one. So phase zero, from the beginning of whenever, to 1985. Phase one is from 1985 to about 1999, a 14-year period. Phase one saw the spread of anybody who was connected to ARPANET, other than Kat and myself, looks like it. Anybody else? ARPANET 3, 4. Don't be shy. ARPANET is fine. <laughs> So there were a few of us who were connected on ARPANET. ARPANET suddenly in 1989 or 1990 became the internet. Suddenly you could send commercial traffic over this thing called ARPANET. And the rest of it, as we all know, is history. So ARPANET, internet, and the dot-com boom. All the way up to the IPO of Red Hat in 1999. I used that as a marker. For a very simple reason. The story I'm telling here is about free software. It's not about anything proprietary. I'm not interested in that space at all. I got zero interest in that. I'm only interested in where open source and free software has come, has come from. So if I use that as a marker, I use that as a marker. Phase one brought us the World Wide Web, the LAMP stack, and opened up browser. How many of you had used Netscape Navigator? Ooh. I didn't expect that response. <laughs> There's a lot of oldies in this audience. <laughs> okay, the kids, you go ask the, you know, those who raise their hands what Netscape Navigator is, all right? Netscape Navigator was closed for, from the beginning, but bang, it opened up for a very simple reason. It made a lot of sense. So phase one's force had street cred to build this public internet, right? But there was a challenge of getting force into the enterprise. The enterprises were, I don't know, is this okay? Is this going to be safe? Is this going to be opening up a, pro a ton of worms? I have no idea. 
I'm very conservative. I don't want to do anything in the enterprise. But that's okay. Red Hat's IPO in 1999 was an aha moment for a lot of companies. They understood, hmm, maybe there is a way to make money from 100% free software. Maybe there is. Then comes phase two. So phase two is from 99 till about 2012. Now, I'm sure most of you could remember some of the things that happened in 99 to 2012. Web 2.0. How many of you have been hearing Web 2.0 to the, to the, until you got so tired of hearing it, right? Web 2.0. Where was Web 1.1 or 1.2 or anything be, before that? We have Ajax. We have Firefox. We have Hadoop. We have broadband. We have smartphones. KVM, Zen, hypervisors virtualization, and open stack towards the end of that time frame. And culminated in early 2013 with the release of a Linux container model called Docker. So to me, that's the start of phase three. So in phase three, we have the whole idea of containers, the idea of infrastructure as a service called OpenStack, and then platform as a service, for example, things like OpenShift. So today we are in, in phase three. And guess what happens in phase three? Voila! We have these tougher enterprise customers suddenly tripping over themselves, coming to talk to, I know I have a lot of engagements with these uh, organizations, I too want to get into free and open source development. I too want to do this in-house. I too want to know how is it that you guys can do all these things. Please teach me. And now that is fundamentally changing everything. So to me, that is a real uh, opportunity to ask question. So has FOSS won? I assert that FOSS did win phase zero, phase one, phase two. Phase three is well underway. Whether we will win or not, I'm not sure. But my money is on that we will win it. And this is where science suggests that that is the way forward because science also wins in phases. You go into the science center later on when you visit all the different exhibits in here, you can see how progression happened in different phases, different discoveries, that aha moment, and then takes the next leap forward. Now, what is going to come with gravitational waves, I have no idea. But it's going to be amazing stuff to think about and the possibilities. So as we move into IoT, which is the theme of this conference, and the whole idea of sensor networks, and in the Singapore context, smart nation, we need to build solutions, technologies, whatever, to make this possible. And all of this has to be driven via open source technologies. Any other way is not going to cut it. We are going to be dead in water if you go any other path. So the intellectual haven that is a science center reminds us that open, open is the best way forward. And so it shall be for open source. So phase three, to me, is an amazing time to be alive. And we have the youngest participant here. I think she's what, one year, three months old. You know, her reality is going to be open source. There was no such thing as proprietary software. By the time she hits school, she probably has no concept. It's like, that, those must have been the dark ages. And we have essentially, I think, won the game. So viva la force. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Harish.